I broadcast the Iowa-Minnesota game. And it was a homecoming game and about 50,000 people and the first time ever up in a press box. And I got through and he told me I had the job and now I'd get $10 a game in bus fare. <laughs> from Dixon, Illinois. That's good. Cool. <laughs> that started. Wasn't there a story about you actually doing a game and something happened during the course of the broadcast and you had to add a little of them? Uh, yes, we had quite a session with some sports announcers in here the other day. Mm -hmm. Whole big table full of telling stories. It was the Cubs and the Cards. I was by that time. Now, we'd go on to 50,000 watts, so we were kind of a key station. I was broadcasting the Cubs and Cards telegraphic report. Ninth inning, tied up, nothing to nothing. Billy Jurgis at bat. And I saw my operator on the other side of the window start to type, so I knew the slip was going to come through with the play, so I dizzy him around, and I had him come out of the wind-up and start a ball toward the plate, and took the piece of paper <laughs> that said, the wire's gone dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, you know, in those days, there were a dozen of you broadcasting the same game, and uh, I wasn't about to say we'll have a brief interlude of transcribed music. <laughs> I, he thought, well, I, and I had a ball on the way to the plate, so I had Jurgis followed off. <laughs> he looked at the operator, and he did like this. So I had Dean use the rosin bag and then shake on his <laughs> I had him foul that one off. And I had him foul one that just missed being a home run. <laughs> And he fouled one back a third, and I described the two kids that got in a fight over the ball. <laughs> it's a long fight. But now I'm really beginning to sweat because now I realize I've had the man of bat hitting successive foul balls more than anyone has ever done. <laughs> but then I can't now say that we've lost our wire connection. All of a sudden, I saw Curly start typing. And through came the paper. I looked at it. I could hardly speak. I started to giggle. As it said, Jervis had popped out on the first ball pitch. <laughs> <laughs> For days, people would stop me on the street and say, has anyone ever stayed at the plate? And yeah. <laughs> I'd say, I don't think they keep that record. <laughs> was Mel Allen one of the people here? Was uh, was cast was that? Yes. Yeah, yes, he was. was. Yeah. He told a story at our last radio convention. That was the funniest story I've ever heard about a guy who had a um, memory problem and uh, gets up to the play. They never use this player, and only in emergency situations. So there's men on first and third, and the score is tied or whatever, and uh, the, uh, he kind of loses uh, track of what he's doing. He's at the play, and the guy from first tries to steal second. So the catcher throws to the second baseman. Second baseman takes the ball and rifles it back to the plate because the guy from third is trying to score and the batter hit a home run. <laughs> second baseman. It's <laughs> <laughs> the relay back to the catcher and the guy's standing there and the ball comes in. Hit it for a three run home. <laughs> there was one story there at the table. I know I can't keep you any longer here, but there was one story that I had never, and I can't remember the name of the sports announcer that did it. He was, he was great for making mistakes and so forth, but he was never flustered by anything. And he was doing a football game. Man came on around in, he's going down the sideline, and he's got him going there and heading for the for the goal line for a touchdown. And his spotter is pointing at another, he's calling the wrong name as carrying the ball. <laughs> he makes that touchdown, of course, it's gonna get in the scorebook and everything. And this fella not unflustered a bit. He says it's the 35-yard line and he laterals off. <laughs> The <laughs> 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 good old days of radio. <laughs> well, I think for the ladies, because sometimes they, you know, the radio may not work and they may have to read or something. <laughs> so here's some souvenirs. Thank you very much. Bookmarkers. Oh, that's very much. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman cufflinks. Thank you. It's the same seat. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Souvenirs. I want to tell you one thing. We're doing it. This has nothing to do with this group. This is my other life. We're working with uh, your son, Ron Jr., on a television show, and you'll be very proud. Well, now. He is, let me tell you one quick story. He said, Ron, we need a biography of you. Can you get one of this? He brought it over and dropped it off himself. 
Dean is, uh, he's a terrific. Oh, I tell you, the, the, the latest thing I'm waiting to see on the Good Morning Show is they sent him down to Florida to skydive. He's oh. never done it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As a parent, you'll have a different <laughs> he, he, had to, he had to do three skydives before oh. he got it. But oh, he's a great guy, he really is. He, did Mrs. Reagan proud. know that was going to happen? <laughs> did Mrs. Reagan know that was going to happen? Uh, yeah, he told her on the phone. And I held her hand from then until he did. <laughs> thank you very, very much for allowing us to take some of the time. Well, thank you all. I'm, you know, I'm very proud. He's really, he's really turned out to be all right. And he, and he can't, I think, quite make up his mind yet which way he's going because he's writing, you know, for magazines and so forth. Good Lord, his coverage of the Democratic Convention back there in 1980 was just great. And then he went over to they sent him to the Soviet Union to broadcast uh, the May Day Parade, and, uh, and he, 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 I never knew he had that writing talent, but it was just great. But now he's the thing you'll be very pleased about too, Big Zen, which for one of the things only because it's parents and I got kids who do this too. Everybody likes him, whether they like you or not. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and the network thinks he's just the greatest thing. He has a reputation all his own, which is well, all he's great. for. That's great. I won't apologize for myself. I've been in the middle of the world. You've got to keep your eye out for this fellow. He's a good I wonder if he voted for me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much. Nice. And thank you for that nice gift. I'm very pleased. Absolutely. And I just wanted to go to the presidential library. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Mr. President, Mr. President, how are you doing? Yes, hi. How are you? Well, you're leaving us. Yes, sir, I am. I've been uh, real proud to uh, be here and serve in the White House. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, you've done it. You have to give me some hard times sometimes. <laughs> well, a little bit. Uh, and Navy regulations say you can't salute indoors and without a hat, but uh, with your permission, I'd like to give you a salute. Well, and since I was a cavalry officer, we didn't have those regulations or rules, you go ahead. Thank you, sir. And I will respond. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You're just a little souvenir, sir. All right. Yes. Thanks for Good luck in the future. Thank you. And you too. Thanks for your time. Oh, this is my pleasure, Mr. Well, well, time. You don't know what a pleasure it is for us, believe oh, me. This is the answer to a lot of right prayers. Oh, welcome home. Oh, I'm so happy. So happy. Yeah. We're yeah. happy. Thank you, Mr. Oh, pleasure. Nice to see you. Thank you. Pleasure to see you, sir. Thank you. Oh, nice. Welcome back. Oh, it's fun. Great to meet you. We just ran out. Yes, sir. Well, I think we're going to go outside there for a photo opportunity. Yes, that's the way out of the I don't know how much you've been told, but as a hospital administrator, I believe strongly in the rights of privacy, and I have been fighting with the fourth estate, third or fourth estate, and people that hide behind their shame and their intellectual dishonesty <laughs> behind the First Amendment, just intolerable. Yes. And I plan and I are through some people in the government already, I hope, to be able to shame them a little bit. There was one incident when on television, it said coded message. I sincerely gave my expression of sympathy to the widow and the daughters that I thought that Bill Buckley had. And somebody over here picked it up, and when I saw a coded message, I thought, oh, oh it is coming. Then another occasion when they went through on all the mistakes and dictation, next time I was ordered to do something, I said, well, I better, I'll just do it. I said, it's lousy grammar, I'll write it out, you don't spell it that way, boys. Well, I was in isolation for 44 days, and he played around with my feet and a few things. So I think I'd like to help shame them because they don't realize what they say today. In 24 hours, we've seen around the world, 
and I admire you people in government, what you've gone through, and anything I can do to help have a little intellectual honesty, I'd be more than happy. And I apologize to you, Mr. President, that I did not get my absentee ballot in time. <laughs> <laughs> Awful happened in California, and I don't know what to do. Uh, well, listen, you, you can, we here, with this whole speculation, I think, that's going on now, our tone has been, we started with no comment, but our tone has been now the effect that there's no way we can answer any of these questions on this without endangering the people we're trying to help. And that's true, because the people that are holding um, our friends over there are not Americans, different standard of reference. Uh, they will like on coded message question mark. They, they didn't know what coded. The question mark was I had embarrassed them by sending a coded message. Uh, and uh, difficult situation. And it's, uh, we should have a press. We shouldn't have censorship of it. But they sure make your life miserable. <laughs> and you have my sympathy and empathy. And you have it too, because you have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they, just, if they just be quiet and let us try to work this out, you know, which we've been trying to do, but they make it more difficult. Impossible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well you could be say. Quiet there, let them get out of the rain. <laughs> no, no, they don't have pneumonia yet. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll come back in here and come forward to the rain. You'll be on the left, the president will be on the right, and Mr. Jacobson will obviously be. I certainly have some words, and I would like to read them. I usually like to speak contemporaneously. Endangers the possibility of further rescue. 
your own party of majority you said well, you, you didn't hear what I said at the beginning. <laughs> Unreasonable speculation on your part and endanger their lives. I would like to take some time now and talk, but this is a day of joy for me. I have my children inside. I want to share it with them, and I will and back off. Thank Mr. Jacobson, how are we to know what is responsible and what is not? How about your <laughs>